Our next speaker is Chanson Drew. And so Chanson is, um, uh, has, so, so the other part of the story that I really wanted to capture here on the science side of things was what has happened on the, on the, uh, the interactions of this team with the pharmaceutical space. I mean, it's been a mess. Uh, I mean, as Richard has shown, you know, it's gone from multiple pills a day to one pill a day. Um, to, you know, and, 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 and again, this kind of pharmacogenetics, real-time pharmacogenetics that these guys are, are, uh, are, are, are actually delivering is just remarkable. So I really want a chance to speak to that. So please join me in welcoming Chancey. to exchange genetic material and infect them. 
And the way that it enters cells is it uses one of two so-called co-receptors, one of which is called CCR5, one of which is called CXCR4. And over the course of, uh, a, a course of time where a person is infected, to, uh, the, their HIV tends to evolve from a virus that uses the CCR5 receptor uh, at the time of infection, and over the course of years, variants that use CXCR4 start to emerge. What happened in uh, about five years ago is that Pfizer and V developed an entirely new class of drugs called CCR5 co-receptors, and Mirabarok was the first example of such a drug. However, since there is this natural progression from CCR5 to CXCR4, from one flavor of virus to the other, is that Patients needed to have their viruses screened prior to uh, initiating drugs because Mirabarok only works on the type of virus that uses the CCR5 inhibitor. And um, this was a big, big problem that affected how this one drug would be able to uh, enter the marketplace. Uh, it's an excellent drug. It is a drug that it will is able to treat people that have really treatment experienced, have resistance to the other class of drugs. But without having a successful test to screen for the type of virus, this drug would never have had any success. The huge problem here is that HIV is, of course, extremely variable. Um, what this, this plot shows is that is kind of a, a, the, the scale of uh, HIV variation across the world. Uh, what it's showing is a is that in a single individual, the amount of variation in HIV in that person is approximately equal to the amount of variation in flu worldwide. Uh, within a small geographic location, this variation is even larger. Uh, worldwide, there's a huge variation in, uh, in, in HIV. But what this really means is that a single individual isn't infected with one type or one strain of HIV. They're actually infected with tens, hundreds, maybe even hundreds of thousands of viruses that each are slightly different from each other. However, a small portion of these viruses could be drug resistant, or a very small portion of them could use the wrong co-receptor for this one drug. So what we need to do, or what other people need to do, is develop methods or assays um, to detect very small amounts of slightly uh, drug resistant or slightly more uh, uh, in, uh, drugs that are, sorry, viruses that would be not susceptible to certain drugs. And this is where we're moving towards uh, methods that use next generation sequencing to identify these extremely rare variants. So emerging resistant var uh, variants or uh, emerging tropism, uh, viruses with the, the wrong tropism can be detected earlier and patients will be able to switch to be switched on to uh, onto more appropriate therapies earlier in their treatment history. So switching back to tropism, um, Pfizer and V needed a assay to be developed in order to screen for this drug Mirabarov. And at the time of their clinical trials, they, were, they, they used a phenotypic method in order to screen for uh, tropism testing. Uh, while this is a, a, a good assay that has very good sensitivity detecting uh, the, the, the tropism of the virus. It is also, it's also the gold standard of testing. This assay was not exactly the correct um, type of assay to move this drug forward into clinical practice in that it was an extremely slow process to culture virus and observe the phenotype of the virus directly. It takes about a month or so to, to get a, a, a result for this test, which, as you can all believe, is not very practical in the clinic. It's also an extremely expensive assay, costing upwards of $2,000 per test. Some, and for a test that needs to be done before therapy, at times of uh, treatment failure, this isn't really a viable option. It requires, it has a, a number of uh, practical disadvantages as well, in that it requires a large fresh, fresh blood draw. It can only be done on uh, samples that have a detectable amount of virus. Uh, it has a relatively high failure rate. And probably the most annoying part is that there's only one lab in the world that can do this test. And that lab is in San Francisco. And the practicalities of shipping infectious materials from around the world to the US is just one that needed to be overcome. And um, 
this is where we and other labs in the world um, try to step up and develop new ways to do this type of uh, testing. And given our history of, a long-standing history of developing viral assays, uh, developing resistance tests, our, we got the attention of uh, Pfizer and Beeb and gained their trust in order to develop what, we're, what we uh, did develop was a genotypic HIV trophism test. Essentially, you can think of it as another type of resistance test in that you can sequence a portion of the HIV genome, in this case the, the HIV on gene or the B3 loop. Uh, it's a short stretch that's only about 100 base pairs long. You can process this data with a bioinformatic algorithm that tells you the probability that your virus is, uh, comes from a virus that uses the bad co-receptor, which we'll call X4. You can quantify the amount of X4 virus present uh, if you're using an next generation sequencing method. And if the sample has amount of X4 or bad virus above some certain threshold, you can provide instructions to the physician to say, hey, wait a second, Maraviroc might not be the best option for this patient right now. And the CFE has successfully demonstrated that HIV tropism can be predicted, can be predicted from viral sequence quickly, accurately, and most importantly, cost-effectively. Um, and it really came from an interaction with uh, industry that allowed us, an interaction with industry of allowing us access to their materials, access to funds, their samples, and their support that allowed us to do this. Um, one of the key aspects of developing any type of assay is that it needs to be validated on actual clinical outcome data. And in order to do this, we needed access to the, the samples used during the clinical trial itself clinical trials of Maraviroc, and uh, Bee was gracious, gracious enough to allow us access to about 2,000 samples used in this, in this test that we retested using our uh, genotypic method, and this was of course done after Maraviroc had already been licensed, and what we have essentially showed is that using this next generation uh, sequencing method, the genotypic method was comparable in predicting virological outcomes. So what this is just showing is the amount of, the, how much virus has decreased from the patient's bloodstream over the course of about 48 weeks of treatment. And what this shows is that this, uh, people with the good type of virus, the R5 type of virus, detected by in black here, uh, the genotypic method, performed equally as well, or had an equal amount of success as those people tested with the phenotypic and similarly, those people identified as having the bad type, the X4 type, did uh, poorly and comparable with uh, those people tested with the trophies, or the, the, um, the phenotypic method. And of course, uh, individuals treated with placebo, there was no effect. So this data came from about 2,000 samples that we had, um, we were able to, to uh, receive from, from industry here. The other thing is that your, uh, the success of an assay is only as good as its adoption um, among other clinical providers. <laughs> and in this case, we were able to successfully demonstrate that the assay that we had developed in BC could be translated to other locations. In this case, Quest Diagnostics, which is a, a large provider of laboratory services in the US, um, Quest and us, we did a cross-lab comparison uh, of results using approximately 300 samples tested <coughs> using our method that they had adapted in their lab. Uh, what essentially this is showing is that uh, across labs using a similar method with only slight differences in some reagents and some data processing steps, we were able to achieve very good concordance between uh, tropism testing definitions uh, between labs. And what's important to show is that in the, in the um, now in the generation of, of next generation sequencing testing, it's really only these types of comparisons of inter-lab concordance can be used to assess the validity of a test. There's no real way to do gold standard testings of standard samples, and it's really only the repeated measurements of, of uh, samples over the longitudinal period that will allow you to, to um, test the validity of an assay this way. Um, I would be up here today talking about a whole genome assay that we've developed in HIV if it wasn't for some uh, major technical difficulties that we, uh, that we, that we experienced
experienced along the way. And here is, a, uh, is an example of where we've interacted with uh, techno uh, technology companies, in this case Roche and uh, Illumina, in order to try and improve the, the way that these assays are performed. Um, one huge limitation of the Roche platform that we um, initially started developing these assays on was that it has poor performance in areas of homopolymers or repeated sequences. Unfortunately, HIV is riddled with these homopolymer regions, and even more unfortunately, these homopolymer regions occur uh, a lot of the time at very key resistance, uh, key resistance mutation sites. So in this case, this uh, 103, uh, K103 position in the reverse transcriptase it has a mutation there, it has a possible mutation there that can wipe out an entire class of drugs. And unfortunately, it falls within this uh, motif that is six A's followed by a G and followed by six A's. And unfortunately, up to 10, 20, 40 percent of the time, we're unable to get a, a successful result here. So despite years of working together with Roche to try and improve bioinformatics, trying to improve uh, assay conditions, we unfortunately had to make a switch to a completely different uh, technology platform, in this case the MySeq, which has largely eliminated a lot of these problems. Um, uh, and for other things that I won't get into, we're, we're working closely with Illumina to now improve the, some performance characteristics of this platform uh, beyond this error rate that we've, we've managed to, to, to pretty much solve. And so now we're in the process of translating this test that we developed on one platform to another and going through the same steps of validating on And essentially, we've shown that the two platforms have been able to perform similarly in predicting shortness and outcome. And as I said before, we've now gone, we're now going ahead to develop a whole genome HIV drug resistance, and that, that, that development is ongoing, and we'll follow the same types of path as the, the previous. So I'd now like to switch gears a little bit and talk about the, the human, the host side of things, but also talk maybe about a, an interaction between uh, pharmacy and the center that's kind of gone the other way. We've gotten buy-in from GlaxoSmithKline and others to do some uh, clinical uh, work that has translated into some, some more basic research. In particular, the study of HLA and HLA pharmacogenetics. Uh, what Richard should skipped over in his talk was that there is a single uh, pharmacogenetic test that's performed uh, in HIV called HLA B5701 testing. Uh, what this, this test does is it screens for a, a variant in the human leukocyte antigen, the HLA uh, set of genes called B5701, um, which is associated with a potentially fatal drug reaction called a bacavir hypersensitivity. Uh, patients are screened for this variant before they start the bacavir, and if they are uh, in possession of the B5701 variant, the, if a bacteria is contraindicated. So this was important work that was um, the, the initial work at, of identifying the a bacteria hypersensitivity reaction. A lot of that work was done uh, with some, the support of GSK at the BC Center back in the early 2000s. Um, but all that work allowed us to do additional uh, additional research into more basic uh, science about what HLA means to HIV infection. Um, one of these things was a massive worldwide study uh, called the International HIV Controller Study, of which the BC Center was a small participant. Um, this study aimed to, to investigate uh, what is an extremely rare phenotype in HIV infection called the, the what people call the HIV controller. Um, these are individuals. These individuals comprise less than 1% of HIV infected persons. And they're able to, they're infected with HIV, but are able to control the level of virus down to levels that are undetectable. This is in the absence of therapy. And what we were able to participate in was this genome wide association study um, that took a couple thousand HIV controllers and matched sets of controls and looked through the entire human genome to find the cause of this very rare phenotype. Um, uh, and essentially what this, this study found was that that same variant, that, B, uh, that B5701 variant that caused the bacteria hypersensitivity is also a major contributor to this very rare phenotype of HIV control. Uh, it, it explains a 
approximately 20% of the variation in, um, in this controlled phenotype. The other thing is that this HLA gene is also uh, a major driver of how HIV itself evolves. Um, HIV, of course, uh, can develop resistance mutations to drugs. It can also develop a so-called analog to this that we call escape mutations to for enabling it to uh, evade host selection pressure, in this case HLA. And up to 70% of HIV variability can be attributed to this immune selection. And this was um, work that was, that was um, enabled by uh, past collection of HLA data and an interaction with industry in the forms of uh, collaboration with Microsoft Research in this case. So pharmacogenetics, we have a single test that is currently in use, in routine use in BC, uh, the, the Abacavir hypersensitivity test. However, there are other drugs that, um, uh, that have associated adverse events uh, or laboratory abnormalities associated with them that may have a genetic basis. And a large number of these have been proposed in the literature. So one study that we've recently done is to attempt to validate uh, a panel of these, these tests in order to implement another set of tests that could be used in BC to help guide more, guide more personalized uh, treatments. i go over this very quickly. Um, but we, we tested a panel of 12 variant sequences in about 750 individuals from genes associated with drug metabolism, uh, excretion, uh, ADME genes, if you will. Um, and in brief, we've identified, it, uh, identified variants that affect the, um, the occurrence of adverse events. Uh, in, in one case, uh, increased plasma fabrins levels, which can be associated with um, CNS symptoms in people receiving efavirenz, and, and these types of symptoms lead towards discontinuation of these drugs. Um, and another variant that's associated with, uh, with bilirubin, elevated bilirubin levels. However, there have been no associations with uh, early treatment discontinuations in this cohort. However, through collaboration here with uh, Genome BC, we've taken, we're going to be able to take uh, th this study to the next step, and we're now evaluating a larger panel of these. Uh, variants, 4,000 of them in, in total, and about 1,000 extra patients in order to expand, um, uh, in order to find additional variants that may be associated with uh, adverse events. So, I'd like to uh, bring this all together and, and say that in addition to having an assay, uh, 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 the only way for an assay to be successful is in order to uh, be able to translate it to another, another lab and have it adopted. Wide, I'd like to point out that the, the Center for Excellence Lab has, a, has a, an extreme commitment towards knowledge translation of our, of our technical platforms. Uh, the, the biggest example of this is how we've managed to, uh, to, to uh, translate and to disseminate our tropism testing method worldwide, and now that it's been adopted in over 30 labs uh, worldwide, we've even published this as a, a, a video a video guide in the Journal of Visualized Experiments, if you can follow along in your own lab to do our, our methods. We have a, also have a strong commitment for training technicians to do drug resistance and tropism testing. Um, we've trained about half a dozen or so patients, brought them, uh, sorry, half a dozen uh, technicians from around the world, brought them in our lab for a couple of weeks to, to show our, um, our, our drug resistance testing methods. On the software side of things, uh, we've developed automated sequence analysis software that standardizes drug resistance testing um, and eliminates interoperator uh, variability in how uh, sequence data is interpreted. And again, these, uh, this software is available free of charge on our website and has been implemented in labs worldwide as well. So, having a history of this, uh, we have a commitment to make all future genetic assays and all future software associated with these genetic assays available um, uh, free of charge and uh, will follow this type of model in the past. So we've had a long-standing uh, history of success in HIV in developing um, genetic tests, both on the viral and the host side. Well, what is the future holding for the Center for Excellence? Um, uh, the future really is that we set up this platform that allows, uh, for which we, we've uh, 
characterize both the virus and the host side in, in, in parallel with the specific aim towards HIV. However, this model can be generalized to pretty much any uh, viral disease or viral pathogen um, out there. And the most interesting case of this right now is, is in terms of hepatitis C virus in, in BC. There's been um, major developments in, the, in the, the ability to treat HIV in, in the last few years with the, with the clinical approval of the first few what are now being called direct and acting anti antivirals for HIV, HCV, sorry. Um, there are now four drugs that specifically target HCV and and for the first time, we're able to see a possible cure for uh, HCV on the horizon. However, these drugs are ridiculously expensive. They cost about $1,000 per patient to treat, or per patient, sorry, per day to treat, uh, and for, a, for a treatment that can last as long as six to 12 months. These drugs also have known resistance profiles and have known host markers that influence their, uh, their, their efficacy. So what can clearly be shown is that there's this opportunity for us and others in the world to develop new tools to tackle a new pathogen, that, um, a new pathogen, a new, a new challenge, and in this case, it's gonna be in the form of additional resistance testing and additional laboratory genetic testing in BC. And with that, I'd like to conclude and thank everybody at the center, especially Richard,